Happy New Year. Welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online. And of course, all of you here today, thank you for being here. Please remember to pray for our sick this week. We have several families that are dealing with COVID. I know they'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, there's a marriage workshop that's presented by Live the Life Adventures in Marriage on January the 7th. It's free. You can get more information on our website, argyle.church. We are continuing in our study through the book of the New Testament, the book of Acts. The book of Acts to the ends of the earth, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through his church. This is part 23. We'll be in Acts 10 if you want to follow along in your Bible. Our God is a supernatural God. And that means that he does things in ways that we cannot always understand or comprehend. And we see the supernatural work of God in the book of Acts. Not the supernatural work of people, but the supernatural work of God as he performs miracles. We see God heal the sick. Sometimes deceivers will counterfeit a miracle of healing. In other words, they will fake a miracle to make themselves look spiritual. But when God heals the sick, and I believe he heals the sick today, it is a real, authentic, eyewitnessed healing. Also in the book of Acts, we see God raise the dead. Now try faking that one. Our God is a supernatural God. And he performed miracles and wonders and signs to authenticate the message of the apostles. Now sometimes we are tempted to over glorify the early church that the early church is our model church because the early church was perfect but we can easily see in our study of the book of Acts that the early church was not perfect in fact no church is perfect not even Argyle because the church is people and no people are perfect. Some go from church to church to church to church looking for that perfection that they will never find. All churches have problems. Even pastors have problems just like you have problems. And to run from problems is not the answer. God expects us to deal with our problems as we look to him for strength and guidance and wisdom to help us through difficult times and difficult circumstances. And one of the problems that we see in the early church and is in our churches today that is exposed in the book of Acts is prejudice and racism. And it's bad enough that prejudice and racism exist in our world today. It's even worse when it's in our churches. And people who are from another culture, another background, skin color, social status, can find themselves unwelcome in the church. And that is so sad. Prejudice. And racism breaks the heart of God. So should we embrace and celebrate the diversity of our ethnicities? Yes. But should that diversity divide and exclude? No. And this is Jesus' prayer for his church in John 17 and verse 21. Father, I pray that they can be one as you are in me 
and I am in you, I pray that they can also be one in us. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say in Galatians, in Christ, there is no difference between Jew and Greek, slave and free person, male and female. You are all the same in Christ Jesus. And we see that the door of faith was opened to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And the door of faith was opened to the despised Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And now we see the door of faith opened to the hated Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. A Gentile is anyone who is not Jewish. And so that represents a lot of people. And can you imagine excluding, despising, hating a whole people group just because of their ethnicity? People did it then. People still do it today. And the scriptures teach that that attitude, that way of thinking, that way of living is wrong and needs to change. This is Jesus' command to his church in Matthew 28. So go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have taught you and I will be with you always even until the end of this age. It is impossible for us to carry out the Great Commission without first tearing down the walls of prejudice and racism. The fact that God wanted all people of the world to be included in the saving grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ was a difficult pill to swallow for the early church. God had a plan for the church. And he clearly spelled it out for all Christians to follow in Acts chapter 1. But when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will receive power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world. Christians who are filled with, who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, will not have any room in their heart for prejudice and racism. Verse 1. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius. Caesarea was a Roman city that was built by Herod the Great. It was named after the emperor, Caesar Augustus. The Romans occupied the land and the Jews were forced to live under their oppression. Caesarea was the center of the Roman government in Judea. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. Cornelius was a Roman military officer. He was stationed in Caesarea. He was a centurion, which meant there were a hundred soldiers under his direct command. Verse 2. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. A devout man who feared God was a title that the Jews gave to the Gentiles who attended the synagogue, who prayed to God, who lived by Jewish principles, but they had not converted to Judaism. He was a devout man, feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. Cornelius was a religious man. He was a good man. He was a generous man. And in spite of all the good things he did, 
he was still despised because he was still a Gentile. And because of his nationality, no Jew would have anything to do with him. Verse 3. About three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius. And staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord? The angel told him, Your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now the first question I had when I read this, if this is so important, then why didn't the angel just go ahead and explain the gospel message to Cornelius? Why did they need to send for the Apostle Peter? And even though we do see angels sharing the gospel in the future in the book of Revelation, God, in his wisdom, has chosen to use people to carry out his mission. God wants to share his love with others through people just like you and just like me. We need to be thankful that God did not wait for the Jewish Christians to reach out to the Gentiles. If so, we might still be waiting to hear the gospel. Thank God that Cornelius, the despised Gentile, took the first step Cornelius reminds me of Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus in John chapter 3. Cornelius and Nicodemus were both very religious. They were both good people who did good things. They both went to church. But going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to Taco Bell makes you a bean burrito. Cornelius And Nicodemus were both good guys. But Jesus told Nicodemus, in spite of his goodness, he still needed to be born again. And Cornelius needed that relationship with Jesus too. The gospel is the good news. The good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. That he was buried and he was raised to life on the third day. And that we can repent of our sin and accept God's free gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And it's not just for non-religious people who are far from God. The gospel is for religious people too. People who do good things. People who live a good life and go to church. They need the saving grace of Jesus Christ also. Cornelius did not waste any time even though it was late in the afternoon. And he sent three of his men on a 35 mile long trip to Joppa. And they were to bring Peter back so that he could share the gospel in Caesarea. Verse 9. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat, just like some of y'all right now. And But while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. And in it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Now just like Saul and Ananias earlier in Acts both had similar visions 
that confirmed it was God who was speaking to them. Peter and Cornelius both had similar visions that confirmed it was God who was speaking. And sometimes Christians make big mistakes when they claim that God told me to. But what they claim God told them to do is sometimes not supported in Scripture. It's not confirmed through time and prayer. It's not validated by godly counsel. So what they are doing, in essence, is taking God's name in vain to try to get what they want and at the same time appear to be spiritual. But here, we see God at work in the lives of Peter and Cornelius. And it is supported by Scripture. And it is confirmed through time and prayer. And it's validated by godly counsel. And in, in Peter's vision, he sees a huge tablecloth filled with unclean animals. Now, that doesn't mean that these animals needed a bath. Unclean means that there were certain animals that the Jewish people were not allowed to touch and must, much less to eat. Peter was shocked that God told him to eat something unclean. Verse 14, No, Lord, Peter said. Now I've heard it said that it is impossible to use no and Lord in the same sentence. Think about it. If God truly is the Lord of your life, how can you ever say no to him? Now, I'm sorry to say that I've said no to God before. And every time I did it, I was wrong. Verse 14. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure or ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times. And suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. In the Old Testament, the Jews demonstrated their commitment to God by staying away from anyone and anything that was ritually unclean. And there were some good reasons for this. One reason was it provided guidelines for a healthy diet in a time that lacked food safety. But the main reason for the rules was to remind the Jewish people that they were set apart to God and that they should honor God in every area of their life. The New Testament teaches that we are no longer judged for the food that we eat. That's why I had a Twinkie for breakfast. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled the law and set us free by grace and truth. In the New Testament, we have a relationship with God, not by keeping all of the rules, but by being filled by being controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead us to have real life change through Jesus from the inside out. Now this freedom we have in Christ does not mean that we can live our life however we choose. Freedom in Christ is a higher calling to obey the scriptures and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. It does not mean to live your life by the values of our culture. Verse 17. While Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, right away the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up 
go downstairs and go with them with no doubts at all because I have sent them. Did you know the very best way that we can start every day is to ask the Holy Spirit for His leading and His guidance? God will never lead us to do something that is against the teaching in Scripture. We can trust in the Holy Spirit. We can leave the guidance to Him and simply follow where He leads. That's exactly what Peter did. He trusted the Holy Spirit. He went with Cornelius' men, the despised Gentiles, with no questions asked. He tore down the walls of prejudice and racism and shared the gospel with people who were different from him. Remember that Peter had been raised not to associate at all with Gentiles, with people who were not like him. But God changed his heart. And true faith is always demonstrated by obedience. Peter was willing to put his differences aside. To trust and obey God. And because of his obedience, the walls of prejudice and racism were beginning to be torn down. The gospel was being shared with all people with all nations. So what is God saying to us today? Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Jesus was raised from the dead to reign forevermore. Jesus is the ultimate judge of all things. Jesus came for everyone, every race, every background. And Jesus desires for all of us to put away our prejudice and our racism so that we can be one together in Christ. Jesus is worthy. Let's pray.